Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here with a video that's sponsored by the lovely folks over at Creative Assembly. And they asked me to do something called leveling up your gameplay. This video is essentially part of a series of three found between myself, Zerkovich, and Sirius Trivia. In this particular mini-series, we will be educating you on various aspects of the Realms of Chaos campaign to aid with those attempting to achieve a higher difficulty level for their future campaigns. While Zerkovich will be handling battle-related information and serious trivia will take on advice relating to your economy and settlement management, I'll be guiding you all through some notes on diplomacy in Warhammer 3, as well as dropping some fun little lore tidbits throughout. For this series, we've decided to focus on the Kislevite campaigns, as they function well for a straightforward experience to put the advice you'll learn here into practice. Though, most of what we'll be telling you I think will be very easily applicable across other races as well, especially for the upcoming new types of campaigns and such. So, without further ado, let's hop right in. First, why don't we start with some juicy lore to explain the situation when you begin your journey as one of the Kislevite legendary lords. Do you ever find yourself wondering why Kostaltin and Tsarina Katarin are at one another's throats? Or why Boris Ursus is a popsicle? There are, of course, some vague hints or straight-out information scattered across the opening cinematics and loading screens, but let's just lay it all out here. You see, some time before the game begins, Tsar Boris marched against a massive chaos horde led by the malicious Kurgan known as Hetzar Feidaj. The two armies met north of the River Linsk in a fierce battle, and while ultimately Kislev claimed victory, they did so at great cost as Boris Ursus was mortally wounded. He bitterly refused to die until the enemy had been put to rout, but as Feidaj fled, the Tsar slid from Erskine's back. Before anyone could approach his body, the river swelled without warning, and the motherland claimed Boris for herself spiriting him away with the current. His loyal bear, Erskine, set out on a quest of vengeance to hunt the Tsar's murderers while the rest of the Polk returned home with heavy hearts. Unknown to most, Boris Ursus would be carried to the Frozen Falls, north of Prague, where his body became frozen in state, almost as if to be preserved for some crucial moment. Only the Great Orthodoxy would learn of their creator's resting place, the various cults jealously guarding the knowledge in fear that others might attempt to disturb the Red Tsar or use his body for political or financial gain. So that takes care of everyone's favorite bear rider. But what about the other two? Well, with Tsar Boris gone, the nation of Kislev had suddenly found itself with a particularly nasty power vacuum. You see, Boris Boka was not just the ruler of Kislev, he was also High Priest of the Cult of Ursin, and the creator of a new organization known as the Great Orthodoxy. The religious group served to unify and organize the four main cults of Kislev, allowing them vastly superior authority and the ability to properly defend themselves against manipulations by the Agents of Chaos. Overall, an excellent idea, as Boris himself had prevented the extinction of the Bear God's faith when he became the first official priest of Ursin to pass the initiation rite in over a century. Ideally, the heir to the Tsar simply would have taken over both the throne and high priesthood, but that proved impossible, as Katarin Boka was an ice witch. While not an issue for being Tsarina, as the first Tsarina and many afterwards had been ice witches, the Great Orthodoxy despised the enigmatic sorceresses. Not only was the Ice Court a seemingly secular organization that historically had opposed the rising power of the cults, but every member was a wizard sworn to an entire library's worth of secrets. The Great Orthodoxy opposed chaos above all else, but a fundamental truth of the Old World is that where there's magic, Chaos is sure to follow. Between wizards often miscasting to disastrous results, the reality warping and corruptive nature of large quantities of magic, and demons being literally made of magic, this is a rather reasonable outlook. 
As such, the Great Orthodoxy refused to acknowledge Katarin as their ruler and quickly severed as much of the throne's influence over them as they could. From here enters Kostaltin, a rather mysterious Gospodar who's possessed by such zealotry that he'd make Grand Theogenes Volkmar raise a concerned eyebrow. His passionate speeches and fanatical resolve quickly won over most of his fellow priests, while his seemingly disheveled and humble appearance endeared him to many of the desperate common folk in Kislev. So the stage is set, with Tsarina Katerin controlling the throne thanks to her bloodline and tradition, but also reinforced by the scheming ice court, while Kostaltin rallies the great orthodoxy to oppose her. Both desire to reunite Kislev's power structure under one rule, as Boris had done, but they cannot afford to do so through open conflict. While Kostaltin would surely love to burn the Tsarina at the stake, or Katerin introduce the High Patriarch to a new meaning of cold, both know that a civil war would mean near instant death for Kislev. Even united, they struggle to hold back the tides of chaos, not to mention many of the southern powers would surely try to take advantage, as much of the southern oblast once belonged to the Empire. So, diplomacy is the only option, though with all the cloak and dagger politics tends to bring along. That segues into our actual gameplay discussion, which is of course, diplomacy! I think I did that somewhat smoothly at least. In any event, there are actually quite a few methods you could use in your campaigns to aid in sweet-talking the AI. So buckle up as we work our way through them. Regardless of what faction you're playing, the secret to diplomacy is to nickel and dime the AI like you're a barely successful YouTuber trying to claim write-offs on your taxes. For instance, never just declare war on an enemy you intend to fight. First, you should check if any of your desired allies are already at war with them. If so, ask that faction to join their war so you can earn some free coin or perhaps use that to negotiate some other agreement. Not only will this start off by making them happy, but will pay easy dividends as any time you attack the faction your, ar uh, your ally hates with your armies or use heroes against them, it will give you even more bonuses. And you should really be trying to have as many mutual enemies as possible, of course, without overstretching yourself or biting off more than you can chew. Once you have a mutual foe, you of course will want to focus on making yourself as powerful as possible by recruiting lots of troops and building armies. While the initial conversations with the faction can be slowed a bit by the great power penalties, if you desire end goals like alliances, confederation, or acquiring vassals, then you'll need to be carrying a big stick. So now you've gotten yourself some decent agreements with the faction in question, but they still are proving to be an ass when it comes to some particular pact. Perhaps they won't grant you a trade agreement or that juicy defensive alliance. Maybe you're trying to badger them into becoming your vassal. How can you really bend them to your will? Well. I'll tell you, the true secret to major diplomacy bonuses outside of just bribing them with money is the trade settlements feature. That's right. If you need the AI to agree to your terms, there is truly nothing more tempting to them than a city. What I like to do in my campaigns is claim control of a settlement that I have little interest in truly using anytime soon. Just make absolutely sure the region in question is bordering a region controlled by the faction you wish to trade, otherwise this won't work. Generally speaking, the more you've invested into a settlement you'll be trading, the more the AI will be willing to do in order to have it. It's a really great way to get those difficult treaties or just gain a bunch of money. I use this strategy a ton, pretty much regardless of who I'm playing. Now, there's one exception to using lots of money or the trade settlement feature or what have you when dealing with diplomacy, and unfortunately, it's the traditional confederation system. As I'm sure many have noticed, at this time, 
you cannot negotiate with the AI if confederation is your desire, which I think is dumb and hopefully will change in the future, but it is what it is right now. The only thing you can do is hope they're interested by checking quick deals. But what you should do if the AI is unwilling, but you really want them to confederate, what do you, how do you deal with that? In my experience, the best thing you can do is just continue building your strength and do everything you can think of to make them as happy with you as possible. Start wars with all of their enemies, though, you know, one at a time. Give them small bribes every turn. Claim settlements in their incomplete provinces or areas you don't want to expand into and just hand them over. Stuff like that. So long as you're a sufficient strength and continue increasing their positivity towards you, it should steadily make that confederation more and more likely until you eventually manage to get them over the mark. In an absolute worst case scenario, you can always take a more drastic approach and try to use the coordination feature in an attempt to convince your allies' armies to go either on too long of a journey or go in a really bad direction to get caught out by an enemy. Basically doing anything in your power to get them killed because the weaker they are, the better of a position you're in. I have often found that a strategy that can work is if there's an enemy AI laying siege to a city of my ally, if I move a big army next to that city, sometimes my ally will attempt to sally out and fight the enemy because I'm within reinforcement range and they think, oh, my ally's gonna help and I just won't. <laughs> I'll just abandon them to their fate and refuse to join the fight so they just die instead. If that happens, usually the city will get sacked or raised or something. And in that event, that's great for you because that means that your ally just got weaker. So anytime you can try and kind of help your ally suffer a major defeat, generally you want to do that unless they are already, of course, in a position that you're happy with. For instance, they're a different race than you are and they're a military ally, in which case you probably want to keep them as strong as you can. But... The weaker they are, the better off for you. If you're trying to confederate someone, I have found that paying very close attention to what their armies are doing and waiting for that inevitable moment when they overextend and they get their ass handed to them by one of the AI or you manage to trick them into getting a 20 stack killed or something. When that happens, that is the ideal time to start striking for major diplomacy deals. The weaker they are, the better for you. Finally, there's the confederation mechanic between the ice court and the great orthodoxy. This is actually super simple to achieve. Just spam the church building structure in every single settlement to farm supporters as fast as possible and you'll dominate that race in no time. You do need devotion to build these structures, but you need a very little amount of devotion and you can farm devotion pretty easily by just making sure you don't have that much because it'll continuously spawn chaos armies attacking your cities. Or you can, of course, just go up to Norska or wherever you want to. There are chaos people and just slap them around a little bit. That will be it for this particular video. But remember that this is only one of three. Be sure to check out the leveling up your game videos by Zerkovich and Serious Trivia as well, which I'll have links to down below. In any event, I hope this video assists with your diplomatic efforts, or at the very least, you learn some cool tidbits about Kislev. Thanks again to Creative Assembly for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.